because today we're going to have a message on God, mastering God's Word. Let's just get to the slide first. All right, mastering God's Word. Now, I don't know what you guys are reading. Trust me. This is way better. Okay? Way better. So, put that aside, and we're going we're gonna to open this guy this morning. And what my goals are this morning is to flick to the next slide. And it's over there, right? Okay. Oh, wait. Okay. First off, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, who here has ever been offended, wronged, or hurt in some way? Okay, just ask my wife. This morning, we had a kerfuffle in the car. <laughs> right? Now, could be intentional, could be unintentional, but we're going to talk about forgiveness. Now, my goal this morning is to give you guys, as much as possible, a very practical example of forgiveness. And first, I want to say, I'm sorry. Why? Rob, I don't know, you must have had to forgive me for something. <laughs> Maybe something still lingering, I don't know, Ardem, who knows? In S, anything? No. I, one of the things about forgiveness is we need it. Not having it is completely unacceptable for God's people. Okay? It kills the unity in the church. Now, one of the things that, that Jesus did is he showed us how to forgive. And in, in the Lord's Prayer right here, in, in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, one of the parts I want to zero in on a little bit is in verse 12. And when Jesus is showing us how to pray, he says, forgive our sins just as we have forgiven those who did wrong to us. Now, that's from the easy-to-read version. Now, think about that for a moment. How many of you are so bold to pray that, okay, Father, forgive my sins, but only as much as I forgive other people? That is a previously unheard of standard of forgiveness amongst one another. In this, this unmerited forgiveness, this is a huge part of the New Testament. That's, that's why Jesus came. He came to forgive us. He provided the ultimate example of how to do that. And why does he want that? If we don't forgive one another, in in this church right here, what's going to happen? We'll have, like, we'll have factions developing. We'll have this group over here. who are, They're all friends, but they don't talk to this group over here. And, oh, and those guys back there. No. What Jesus wanted, you can see it in John 17, verse 11. He said, Father, may they be one like you and I are one. There's no separation. They are unified, completely unified. That was his prayer for the church. To do that, we need forgiveness. Okay? And Ephesians 4. Uh, we're just going to flip there for one second. In Ephesians 4, verse 2 through 6. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read uh, verse 2 and 3, but... It says here, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with each other in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort. That, that's not just some, a lot. No, every effort. That is a lot of exertion. And it's a lot of exertion. And like, just for instance, just breaking that apart. That word gentle. That word gentle kind of has a bad rap today. 
what it actually means in the Greek is to have great strength under control. Like, when I wrestle with my kids, I could beat them every time. Now, mind you, I've got a nice scar here on my forehead from me being a tickle monster with my youngest son and losing the battle. He beat the tickle monster. But I let him beat me. Because I was gentle with him, right? Now, also here, in Matthew 5, this is, here, just flip there for one second. Matthew 5, 23. Here it says, Therefore, if you offer a gift at the altar, and you remember someone has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar first. Go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and give your gift. That, that passage right there tells us to be proactive. Not just, oh, I have to, no, not I have to forgive someone. No, no, no. If you think someone might not have forgiven you, you cannot let that disunity sit. You, you leave what you are doing Go and be reconciled to that person. This is how important it is. God says, you need to make this happen. It's not an option. So, here we go. It, it's on. Ah, it wasn't on. Okay, there we go, that helps. Now, I want to talk a little bit about meditation today and studying your Bible. Okay, now here most of us prefer one versus the other. Now I want to unpack this word meditation for a bit. Now, now many of us, if we think of the word meditation, we think of the Eastern concept of meditation, which is to try to empty your mind as much as possible. Okay, um, but that that's not the idea of Western meditation. Western meditation is to think deeply, okay, and apply it to yourself. So. Um, like, for instance, um, an example of meditating on the idea of forgiveness would be, how am I going to forgive this person who did whatever to me? At, say at work. Okay, well, maybe a good first step would be to pray for that person. Okay? That would be meditating on how to apply God's standards of forgiveness, a direct example in your own life and putting it in practice. Studying, on the other hand, would be what do I have to do? Like what is forgiveness? Okay? So most of us kind of prefer one kind of Bible study over the other. Okay? For me, Bible study, like the academic stuff, is, is kind of my, my happy place. Okay? Um, now, why, why should we study our Bible? Well, personally, I think like meditating on God's Word, like a healthy intake of God's Word, it, it's going to help you meet your needs. But it's also going to help you meet the needs of people around you. Same, same with studying the Bible. Knowing what it says. Okay? In depth, in detail. And, and reasons why. Why? First Peter. Be prepared to answer. If someone has a question about the faith that you have, the hope that you have in Christ, I would hope you should be able to answer it. Right? Also, you want to know what you believe and why. Well, a lot of us are familiar with this passage here, Hebrews 4, 12, verse 13. It says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now, I don't know about you, but swords are dangerous. And I am not going to give my toddler a sword just to fling around. He's going to hurt someone. He's, going to use, he's not going to use it correctly. There is a responsibility in wielding a sword properly. You have to train the mind first, and then they can use that. My, eight, my nine-year-old, I let him use a knife now, and it's just been in the last year. And when he first started, I, I was there making sure, okay, don't turn the knife, 
turn what you're cutting, right? So, so he can use, he can learn it to use it properly. Now, we need to do the same thing with God's Word. Because if we don't, we can have false doctrines all over the place. And we will put a stumbling block between people and God's Word. Also, credibility in the defense of your faith. If, if, if you have almost no Bible knowledge and someone asks you a question, oh, that, like, you need to be a resource that people can go to. Oh, hey, that's the Bible guy. If you've got questions about the Bible, you can ask him or her. Like, like Rob, I was doing rickshaw, okay, in Toronto. This is a long time ago. And everybody knew Rob as the Bible guy because he had the answers and he opened his mouth, right? <laughs> yeah, he definitely opened his mouth. No problem there. Now, here we go. Now, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at an example of forgiveness and we're, we're going to look at the, the book of Philemon, okay? And it's a really interesting book. It's, it's, it's short, and I picked it because we can basically go from start to finish today and get the whole story. And, and one of the things that I want to do is I want to make everybody in this room an expert, okay? So you can all walk out of here feeling like a the theologian after having read this book. Now... When reading the Bible, one of the things that's very important to do is we want to keep it in its cultural and historical context, okay? Because things that they wrote back then meant something to them, which is probably quite different for us. And we're going to look at that. Um, also, the author's intent. What did the author, what was he trying to communicate to the people when this was penned, okay? We want to be faithful to that intention of the text. Also, we can look for themes and literary tools. We can, like, for instance, um, sarcasm and irony. Okay? Um, in 1 Kings here, uh, chapter 18, th this is one of my son's favorite parts of the Bible, because this is Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. Okay? Now, and, and this is where Elijah is taunting the prophets of Baal. And he's, he's saying, is your God busy? Well, I always translate it for them more accurately, and because the actual translation is, is your God taking a dump? Right? But the biblical scholars kind of rounded that off so it didn't offend anyone, you know? And, and they love that. Yeah, yeah, their God's taking a dump, you know? <laughs> or, or in Galatians 5.12, Paul's talking about the circumcision group, which is the Jews. Incidentally, how many of you want to belong to the circumcision group? No? No, not me. Thanks. Um, and, and basically what he's saying is he's using sarcasm there. He's saying, I wish they would just go the whole way and cut the whole thing off. Like, that, that's some pretty direct sarcasm right there, right? Also, in Philemon, what we're going to see is it's not going to be sarcastic. It's going to be irony. Okay? Now, irony is different from sarcasm because irony is when the stated word is the exact opposite of the intended. Okay? Sarcasm does that, but it does it with a kind of a put-down humor sort of thing. Right? So, Paul's not going to do that to Philemon. Also, the Bible can be literal. Okay? Um, if you, for instance, if you, literal, if you insist on a literal reading of the Bible, in everything you will find it is literally full of contradictions, okay? But, but sometimes it is literal. And like, for instance, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not kill. Actually, it's thou shall not murder. But, you know, it's pretty direct. Also, Revelation 21.8. Cowards, you know, idolaters, will not see God in heaven. Pretty direct. Very literal, okay? Also, it can be symbolic, like uh, John 14, where... You know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, I am the way and the truth. He's, it's a symbolic language. He's not being literal. Or when he says, I am the light. 
He's not, he's not trying to convince us that he's the stuff coming out of the light bulbs. Okay? So don't read your Bible literally all the time. Okay? Also, we can have certain things. It, it can be poetic, like in the Psalms. There, there can be, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, there can be onomatopoeia, which is that when you have a word like, for instance, pop, the word is like the sound. Okay? It's onomatopoeia. And also you can have textual references where Paul will refer to something, say, in a, that's in the Old Testament, and there was a context there, and it meant something. So if I say, like, for instance, I make, uh, you know, say I greet someone, and then I do the, you know, this kind of thing, right? That's a Black Panther reference, right? right? And he did it with swag and style, right? So there, there, there's a reference there to the movie, okay? Well, there's also textual references. Now, here's what we've got. Now, one of the things that we want to do when we're studying the Bible is we want to be in context. Now, I'll give you an example of how context can get horribly taken out of the exam. Um, Deuteronomy 23.18. Deuteronomy 23.18 says, Do not bring the proceeds of a dog into the temple. Okay, so does that mean that no one amongst us can have a kennel and sell dogs or own a pet store. No. The context, if you look just one verse before, is a dog is a male prostitute. So basically what it's saying is, okay, don't bring, bring the proceeds of sin into the church and try to give that to God. He's not interested. The organized crime, you can keep your money. We're fine. Right? Um, also, be critical. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, it says, test everything. Hold on to the good. The Bible is telling you to be critical. Okay? Also, in Hebrews 13, verse 7, it says, consider the outcome of your leaders' lives. If your leaders' lives are a complete shambles, don't just blindly follow them off the cliff. No. Consider the outcome of their lives and imitate them accordingly. Okay? Now, other things you can do when studying the Bible is you can invest some time and you can take some theology courses. I've done that. They're great. Okay? Um, notice I put a little dollar sign there on the invest. Right? Right? Okay. Now, actually, one thing I want to do right now is if I have some straws here, you're going to need this later. Can you please pass the straws around? Okay, everyone just take one and, all right? So also, like, um, you can read books on, for instance, a, a particular subject, like uh, a commentary or something like that. And, and basically what those are is it's just someone who has delved into the historical context, um, the original language, and all this sort of stuff, and they just, they, they just assemble this huge amount of information so you can understand what's written more accurately, okay? That's a good thing to do. Like, because sometimes, you know, after you've read the Bible a couple times, you know, maybe you're not getting so much out of it anymore, right? So it's time to take it a little deeper. Also, like, you can, uh, even if, say you don't have the money for taking the theology course. A lot of professors, they put their... Their, um, their lecture stuff online for free. And like, but you have to be critical once again. I'll refer you up top. Be critical. Because Satan is alive and well at theology schools. Okay? Like, if, if you want to see some pretty horrible contradictions in the Bible or things that are wrong, go no further than Genesis 1, chapter 1, with like Kenneth Ham down in Tennessee with his... his <laughs> God, it's, his, his museum of natural history where he's got a cowboy on the back of a dinosaur. And, and he's trying to like say, oh, no, no, the earth is 6,000 years old. Um, okay, that one falls to the rigors of science pretty quickly. Um, but they believe it. Um, now, you can also learn some Greek or Hebrew. Okay? Um, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Um, the Old Testament originally in Hebrew. And, like, why would you want to, to learn Hebrew? Um, well, because, for instance, when you 
like for instance, some of you amongst us, you speak French. And when you speak French, you think differently. You express yourself differently, okay? The same is true in Greek and Hebrew, okay? And like for instance, another reason to increase your faith. But I'll just give you like a little like academic stake just to throw out and try to convince you that this is a cool thing to do. In, in Nahum chapter 2, it uses an onomatopoeic poetic verb, okay? Now, let me describe and unpack that, okay? That, remember that onomatopoeia was that word pop, okay? So, <coughs> basically what you've got is you've got some imagery in Nahum chapter 2. And the, the word in Hebrew for ruined, okay, is bak, all right? And basically God is saying in Nahum chapter 2 that, uh, oh wait, uh, and bottle is bakbuk. Now, if you are, if we're going to say, if you're going to have a bottle and you're going to imitate the sound of it emptying, what, what sound would you make? Yeah, glug, 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 something like that. In, in Hebrew, you don't do that. You do bakbuk, 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 right? So you, you, the, you can hear it. Now, in, in the verse, what happens is ruined and bottle kind of sound the same. Now, if you know your history, the city of Nineveh, when it was conquered, the invading army came up and they diverted the river. And the river then started to flow right past the city walls and it carved out the foundation. So God literally emptied the city down the river. And Hebrew is the only language you're ever going to see that in. Other, other things, like um, um, Aleph, that's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's the, um, the symbol, if you kind of turn our, our letter A upside down, it kind of looks like a cow, right? Well, that was for an ox. But Hebrew, the language has a, a significance or a symbolism with the letter. And that first letter means strength. Okay? And then you've got Beth, which is the second one. And that means father or leader. And it, or sorry, actually, uh, it means house. Uh, my, my apologies. It's like, and the little uh, letter kind of looks like a little triangle with little sticks down. So you've got house. So Abba, Al Aleph, and Beth was the leader of the house. Father, Abba, right? And Jesus calls God Abba, Father. Now, if you keep going and you, you look at, for instance, the name of God in uh, Malachi, in chapter, I think it's one or two, um, what you end up seeing is kind of a string of these things together. And what comes out of it is, with all this symbol, uh, symbolism, is you see that the essence of the Father is love. And that's right in the symbolism and the significance of the language. There's all this stuff that just emerges out of the Hebrew when you take the time to learn these sorts of things. And it's, it's incredible. It will take your Bible study to a completely different level. Now, this guy, Paul. Thanks, Rob. Um, we want to know, we want to talk about Philemon. Okay, we're, we're going to try to apply some of this academic tool stuff to the book of Philemon. And we want to know like when it was written, well, it was written by Paul, who was under house arrest in about 64 AD. And he wrote it at the same time as the book of Colossians, okay? Um, now, the, the backstory is that Paul was in Rome under house arrest, and he ended up meeting this guy named Onesimus. And Onesimus studied the Bible, became converted, and started to believe. Um, now, Unlike other writings, like for instance Romans, um, there's no sophisticated like, arguments of doctrine or, or references to previous parts of the Bible or anything like that. Um, what this is, is it's a very persuasive letter trying to convince Philemon to do something, okay? And the person it's addressed to, is, it's about forgiveness and it's addressed to Philemon. And we're going to go into that in one second here. So, context. Just, just looking at a picture, you can see what's actually happening up top, and then you can see what's on the screen. 
if you don't look at the big picture, you're not going to see an accurate representation of what's going on. And here, this letter was addressed to uh, Philemon, um, who was basically a slave owner. And, and that Greek word right there for slave in this part is, is doulos. Now, what we need to do is we need to kind of unpack that word a little bit. We need to go into the cultural context of the day. So to do that, I want to ask you guys a question. Why learn the context here? Who has a mortgage? OK. OK, I, I've got a mortgage, right? Now, the word slave today, we think of it in kind of a, the context, our cultural context, which is North American slavery, you know, in the Deep South, and that sort of stuff. But, but that's not, there's another Greek word for that, and this is not that, OK? What this means is like an indentured servant, OK? Now, what an indentured servant was, was someone that would go and they'd sign a contract and say, OK, I'll work for you for this, this long. You just, you take care of me, OK? So, so this should be servant. And like, we need to understand this, because when it says we are you know, slaves of Christ, well, that, that, there's no personal act of volition there. You're not doing it of your own free accord. Now, I, I have freedom in Christ. I serve Christ voluntarily. Why? For the same reason that I get up every single morning and I go to work. Why? Why do I go to work? Why do I limit my freedom, right, to sleep in, to play video games at 4 o'clock in the morning and all this sort of stuff? To get something bigger to pay the mortgage, right? Like, for instance, why do I not go on dates with a whole bunch of different women? Why? I chose to limit myself to just my wife. Why did I do that? Because I gained so much more. Right? Now, here, this, this concept is being a servant. Okay? And, and we are all servants of Christ because we want to. We, we do this voluntarily to gain something more. Okay? Now, what you can think of with this word here is a better word for today would probably be something like an employee. Okay? That would be... So let's keep this in the context. All right? So here, what Paul is going to do is he's in this letter, he's going he's to provide some examples of forgiveness, but he's also going to be writing about an example of how, what it means to put, like, for, for instance, Colossians 3, 22 and 24, and 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 2 in, in practice, which is work as if you're working for the Lord. Okay? And as, as we mentioned, the major theme of this letter is forgiveness. Okay? So without further ado, we want to get straight into the good stuff, which... Get straight into the good stuff. Thank you. Uh, which is our backstory, okay? Now, Colossae is right up there. You, you can see it, it's, it's right here, and Rome is over there, up in the corner. Now, <coughs> Anisimus was a slave, or an employee, if you will, who had run away to Rome, okay? This is our, our backstory. Now, what he had done is, to do this, he would have been leaving Philemon, um, not having fulfilled his contract. So this would have cost Philemon money. And you can't go on a big trip all the way to Rome without some money. So he probably would have had to do a little five-finger discount from Philemon to get the money to go to Rome. Now, what's going to happen here is Paul met this guy, Anisimus, in Rome, he becomes converted, and what he figures out is, oh, Onesimus, 
You know this guy that I know, Philemon. Oh, wait, there's a backstory here. You guys are not unified. Hmm, that's a problem. We're Christians, we need to be unified. So what I'm going to do is, if you're going to walk in integrity, I'm going to tell you, you have to go back and be reconciled to your brother, Philemon. Now, this was dangerous for Onesimus, because under the laws of the time, Philemon had the right to put him to death. So this is a pretty high stakes kind of game here for Onesimus. If, are you going to walk the walk? You say you believe in Christ. Are you going to step out on faith on that first step back to Colossae? Now, Paul's not going to send him back, though, empty-handed. Okay? Um, what he's going to do is he's going to write this very persuasive letter to Philemon. And it's actually it's going to be delivered by Tychius and Onesimus. And you can see that reference here in uh, Colossians 4, uh, 7 through 9. The two letters were written at the same time. And what you've got here is I need you at this moment to get out your straw. And I, I want you to turn to Philemon and I want you to start to read the first three verses. Okay? So look at your Bible through the straw and try to read the book of Philemon. How's it going for you guys? A little bit slow? One word at a time? Okay. Okay, how many of you are getting the big picture? No? No, not really, right? You're not really getting the big picture. Lose the straw, okay? Because why I gave you the straw is because that's how many of us read our Bible. We don't read it in the historical context. We don't read it with all this background. We read it word by word, sentence by sentence. And we don't, we don't see how, like, for instance, even just like, what is this paragraph saying? What's the central theme of this paragraph? Okay? Well, we're, we're going to, we want to set the stage. We want to imagine this. Okay? So we've got Onesimus, this slave, who is who's heading back, and he costs Philemon probably quite a bit of money. Now, imagine you're Philemon, you're in your fields, you're working, your, your employees are all around, and, and you happen to look up. And far away, you don't have glasses, but you look <laughs> and you see, is, oh my, me, oh my, is that who I think it is? Imagine the emotion welling up in this guy. The anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the, oh, you're going to get it. And, and then imagine Onesimus walking forward slowly at the last little part, letter in hand. <laughs> Head down and just hands it to him. Philemon opens a letter. And the first word, words that he reads, Paulos. That's Paul in Greek. Now back then, they would, here we, we sign an email at the bottom, right? And you have to scroll all the way down. Okay, okay, I know who it's from. But there, they would, they would put their name right at the beginning. So you knew who it was from. And he reads, Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. Okay, his blood is still boiling. But he has just received a letter from Paul. Paul was like a first century rock star, okay? Everybody knew who Paul was, okay? Now, imagine this is like 
if, imagine you're Catholic and you get a letter from the Pope, okay? You're probably going to read it, okay? Probably not just going to crumple it up and go on with your day. Now, we want to go through here and we want to read this. So, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Appia, our sister, to Ariscopus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, I'm assuming he's going to keep reading. But what we want to do is we want to slow things down for right now. And what we want to do is we want to just kind of unpack this letter. And what I want to show you guys is the persuasiveness that it's written with. That basically what's going to happen is Paul is going to ask Philemon to forgive Onesimus. And he's not really going to give him much of a choice. Okay? So what he's going to do is he's going to write this letter and it's going to, it's, he knows Philemon. Okay? And he's going to use that leverage, like just crank on it, the fact that he has a relationship with Philemon. And he's going he's to use a couple other levers of persuasion in this. And he's going to do what, an argument of, of pathos. Okay? This is a Greek argument style based on, on your relationship with someone. Like, let me give you a for instance. Um, Ardem is a nice guy. I see him buy lunch for someone. So, it doesn't make sense to me that someone's accusing him of pulling the wings off butterflies in his, past, in his pastime. It doesn't meet up with his character, right? So that's an argument based on character, okay? He's gonna do this. He's gonna, basically, Paul is gonna say, I know you're a good guy, and I know you're gonna do the right thing. <laughs> so, now, to open this letter, you'll notice that Paul was under house arrest. Most people would write, I'm a prisoner of Rome. No, no, no. Look in your first sentence here. Paul says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's who I'm in chains for. Okay? And I'm going to remind you of that. And then he also mentions his brother Timothy, who people would have known. This is his, his up-and-comer, his, his protege that's going to take over for him when he's gone. So, hey, it's not just me who knows about this, right? And he says to Philemon, our dear friend, fellow worker, he's going to soften him up here a little bit, right? Massage him. He says to Aphia, our sister, that's probably his wife, and it's also to Ariscopus, our fellow soldier, and to the you know, church that meets at your home. That was probably the leader of the church. So he's addressing it to his wife, the leader of the church. He's like throwing a broad net for accountability here. Okay? And, and Colossae was, was not a very big town. So the church was maybe, you know, 100, maybe 200 max. And, and what happens in a small town? Word gets around. So people are going to know that, hey, 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 Philemon, he received, he received a letter from Paul. Hey, what did it say? Oh, what does it say? It says, Philemon, you need to forgive the guy. And, and then he starts off, grace to you and peace from our God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me remind you, you have been forgiven for your sins, and we all have a Lord, and his name is Jesus. Right? Okay. All right. And then he just goes into it even more. He starts laying it on extra thick. So you've got this unmerited favor. Remember, we're all sinners. We all have a master. So do you. And then he's going he's gonna to appeal to, to uh, Philemon on the basis of love. 
And he says here in verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints. Let me remind you, Onesimus is now a saint. Okay, so basically, you need to forgive him. He's your brother. Okay, so I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. So, in Christ, or sorry, uh, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. If you don't forgive this guy, you obviously do not have a full understanding of what we have in Christ. Okay? So he, he appeals to Philemon's good nature, his obvious good nature, right? And he says here, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, my brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. I know you're a great guy. Philemon, I trust you. I know you're going to do the right thing. You're going to do even more than I ask because you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. By the way, refresh mine too. Okay, so in verse 8, Paul's going to kind of throw around a little bit of his uh, apostolic weight at this point, okay? And, and he's going to kind of remind them, like, hey, you remember that Jesus guy? Yeah, yeah, I saw him, okay? Oh, and he's also going to remind Philemon, I'm in jail, and you might want to remember that. You're sitting right now in luxury. I'm in jail. So let's read that. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Yeah, okay. I could tell you what to do, but I'm going to ask nice. Okay. I then, as Paul, an old man... And now, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, does he have to put in the old man part? Like, I'm an old man. Don't break an old man's heart. Come on. And then he's going to remind him again. Remember, I'm a prisoner. Okay. Like, I just I love this. And then he says, I appeal to you for my son, Anisimus. He's not just calling him... Uh, fellow believer. No, no, no. This is my son. Okay? Who became my son while I was in chains. Once again, another reminder. Right? Hey, I'm in chains here, and this is my son. Don't break an old man's heart. Okay? So, formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and me. Now, this part is great. I love this part. Because if, if we go into the Greek, um, you're, you're going to find Paul's doing a, a pretty clever little play on words here. And, and in English, we have, um, we have the word like um, typical, which means something commonly happens. And then if we put a in front of it, it means it usually doesn't. So like typical, atypical. Now, what anisimus means is it means useful. You, can, you should have like a little note at the base of your, your page that says Onesimus means useful. So it was a very common slave name at the time. But what, what Paul does here is he, he does a little word play. And he uses this word um, for useful for, he says, a Christos. So basically he's been saying before he wasn't useful to you. But now he's you Christos to you. He's useful to you now. So in a way, he's kind of saying, before, he wasn't Anisimus. Now, he is Anisimus. Right? So it's this little wordplay right in there, just kind of, ooh, just gotcha, right? And he's being clever here. He's being very clever. 
And, and here, um, let's see, keep going here. I'm sending you. Now, um, in verse 12, it says, I am sending him who is my very heart. He's, he's laying it on pretty thick at this point, right? Back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. Once again, he's going to rattle his chains a little bit there and, and, and remind Philemon that, hey, I could be asking you to take his place. You owe me big. And here it says, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do to me would be spontaneous and not forced. Really? <laughs> spontaneous. That given his probable state of mind when he saw Anisimus for that first time, spontaneous is not perhaps the word that you know would come to mind. And perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. Perhaps this was God's plan. And have him back for good. He's not going to run away again. Okay? No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is your brother in Christ. All those other passages on forgiveness, keep the bond of unity, all those things, like Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. Father, forgive me, but only as much as I forgive those around me. Philemon is going to have to hold himself to that standard. And Paul is kind of subtly reminding him of that. If you go to the book of Colossians, there's kind of a little bit kind of more context for that as well. And it says here, he is very dear to me, but now even dearer to you, both as a man and a brother in the Lord. Now, it's not enough for, an, for Philemon to receive him back and just say, okay, fine. I'm not going to kill him. Go clean the toilets. No. He has to be restored to him. And forgiven. There has to be that unity, that that oneness, like between Jesus and the Father. That's the kind of unity that he's asking Philemon to have with Onesimus, and that's the kind of unity we need to have as well. Now, it says here, um, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Okay, I I expect you to treat him well. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. He's not discounting the fact that Onesimus cost him money. He's not minimizing any of that. The context he's providing is, you have been forgiven of so much more. So... Like the, the parable of the unmerciful, unmerciful servant, you know, who had some small debt and didn't forgive when his unpayable debt had just been forgiven. Onesimus is going to have to be forgiven by Philemon. And, <coughs> pardon me, um, here in verse uh, 18, if he's done anything wrong, okay, he owes you, charges to me. I, Paul, in verse 19, am writing you this with my own hand, and I will pay it back. Not to mention, you owe me your very self. You owe me everything. (laughs) What I'm asking you to do is pretty small. By the way, you owe me your very self. So you owe me more than you can possibly repay. So... And he says here in verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some small benefit uh, from you in the Lord 
refresh my heart in Christ. We are all under Christ. Forgive him. Refresh my heart. Now, then he starts laying it on thick again. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you'll do even more than I ask. Okay, all right. Then we flip again to chapter 22. And I forgot to do my slides, but here we go. So, oh, wait, just go back there for a second. Okay, so in verse 22, it says, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. I'm coming to check up on you. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to make sure you've done what I ask. Oh, by the way, verse 23. Ephraim, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. This was the guy who history says founded the church at Colossae. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. By the way, I'm not the only one that knows about this. If on some random missionary journey, one of these guys happens to pass through Colossae, which is entirely possible, have that guest house ready for them, because they're going to be checking up on you, right? Now, and then he finishes it off once again. The grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So this is a pretty persuasive letter. Um, He's not pulling any punches here on getting the heartstrings of Philemon, on being persuasive, on kind of flat out right, just kind of manipulating the guy right? To do what he should. Now, here we go. So, like, in conclusion, if I can get the conclusion. There we go, okay. Now, this is basically Philemon, as profound of a treatise on love as 1 Corinthians 13 is, This is as equally, Philemon is as equally persuasive on forgiveness and the need for it, right? Now, also, read your Bible with the big picture in mind, okay? Lose the straw. Any of you who have done high school level English or French or language studies, you can read this text and you can do the exact same thing I have done. You can see the sarcasm. You can see the references elsewhere, right? You can make those connects. You can also make sure you look at the author's intent, okay? What was Paul trying to get Philemon to do? It was to forgive Onesimus. Read between the lines, okay? There is stuff between the lines. There's the pathos here. There's the irony. There's sarcasm, it's literal, it's figurative, it's, it's all these different things, right? Like, especially when he's saying, so it would be spontaneous and not forced, right? Like, um, keep in mind the standard of forgiveness that we are called to. If you have something against someone, stamp it out, Right? It is completely inappropriate for God's people to hold a grudge. Okay, there was one brother in Montreal who went, he had a small problem with one brother who he didn't really talk to very often. And he went and he spent time with him. And he, he kind of, he worked through that. He got, he, he basically forgave the guy. That was awesome because the whole church was more unified after that. That one thing. He might not have seen it, but it's true. Right? Be like Jesus. Forgive. Forgive by receiving and restoring. It's not enough to just be like, okay, fine, I forgive you. 
No, that's, that's not the type of forgiveness Jesus is talking about. And it's not the type of forgiveness he, he gave to us. Last point, know your Bible. I hope you enjoyed it.